Obesity rates for children with disabilities are 38% higher than for children without disabilities, according to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Yet children with disabilities are too often left out of the childhood obesity conversation. To address this inequity, Keen, Kids Enjoy Exercise Now, recently held a summit meeting in Washington, D.C. Titled, Mom, I Want to Play, the symposium featured expert speakers and panelists who discussed the need for, availability of, and obstacles to providing fitness programs for this population. Um, so when I was asked to, to speak here, I was very excited and honored, and then I realized I had to give a 45 minute talk, which was very intimidating because I had no idea what I would talk about, and mostly because I'm not used to speaking to adults, but also because I don't specifically work with kids with special needs and fitness all the time. I, my specialty is kids in general, and then I do the work with special needs kids. I've always just considered that a, a passion of mine and something that I, that I like to do. So when I was thinking of all the different things, that's my thought process, including I have a constant thought of Mexican food and, and burritos <laughs> and, uh, and just those were all my own pictures. The rest is just stock photography of children, funny children doing exercises because that's all I have available to me because of my speaking engagements usually. Um, so I was thinking of all these different things because there were a lot of different topics and, and Kate and Joanna gave me some ideas and what kind of tied them all together is that when I started thinking about them was I realized that a lot of the things that I was going to talk about are things that were important to me having to do with kids fitness in general and working with kids with special needs was that they connected to Keen and that Keen is doing a lot of these things already and it's the reason why I continue to work with Keen so much and I, at this point, with what I do and, and the work that I do with other companies and things like that, I don't lack opportunity to spend time doing physical activity with children. I could spend every hour of every day doing some sort of sports program, but Keen has been the one that draws me back over and over and over, and I realized that a lot of these things were the reason why. So I wanted to talk about a few things, and then hopefully we'll have time questions at the end, or maybe no questions because it wasn't interesting, or, or I answered everything. <laughs> um, so I don't have to go over too much the childhood obesity stats, that's a pretty common thing now. Everybody knows a lot of the numbers or just the general idea that it is a very significant and serious problem. And in my relationship with working in fitness, there have been many times, especially in the first few years that I started thinking that maybe it wasn't the most important thing that I could be spending my time doing because so much of obesity is caused by, I, food is one of the biggest factors and, and even working with private clients or adults, if you aren't eating correctly and they're trying to lose weight or all these other goals, usually that is such a huge factor that I felt like maybe I was putting my attention into the wrong area until I started to realize, especially with kids, that the big thing about exercise is what movement does to our bodies and how it affects us socially, emotionally, how it makes us feel. When I go into schools, the big thing that I talk about is how exercise actually makes us scientifically happier and helps us sleep better and helps us focus better and, and all the side benefits outside of just how it affects to people coming to me asking to lose weight. And that's when I got really passionate about working with kids specifically was talking to them about movement because stats like one in four kids just get enough daily activity and that is just a general number not even addressing special needs kids because when you talk about that population it is a much scarier number and that's what got me very interested in passionate and kind of reignited the flame of working in fitness. That's a dog from my book. <laughs> I did not I did not do the artwork. Um, so when it comes to my fitness philosophy, I've had the same one for a while now, which is scientifically, there, I put it up there, according to science, there's the most, most efficient and effective way for you to exercise. So if you look through the books and through any training program, sports science will tell you the best way for you to work out, and it's pretty straightforward. 
but if you don't enjoy it and or won't do it, it's neither efficient nor effective. And I find this with kids a lot because you can give a kid a program that is good for them, but if they won't do it, then it's not doing anything for them on so many levels. And that, most of the things I'm talking about apply to all kids and apply to adults, which is one of the things that I learned, biggest lessons I learned doing behavior therapy was that the way that you, kids react to the behavior therapy or the way that you interact with people is across the board. And I use the same techniques that I used with those kids on my friends and on my family. And even though they don't like to know that I'm using behavior techniques on them, that's why my sister is my, likes it the least, especially because I make sure to tell her. But um, just that there's such a relationship with everybody, the way that you respond to exercise and respond to motivation and things like that. Um, so for me, the biggest thing when it, when it comes to fitness are, the questions are, um, is what is the goal when you approach fitness for anybody, but specifically for kids. And to me, the biggest things are always movement and exploration. So the question of, are you moving well? Do you feel good doing it? And are you getting to explore different activities and different ways to move your body? Because if you put somebody in a very static exercise or a very static movement, they might not explore and get the same benefits than if you're really looking at whether or not they're moving well. And especially in modern exercise, and more so even on the adult side, the emphasis now is on working hard and on sweating a lot. If you go to any one of the boutique fitness studios in New York, it's a giant thing. I'm sure DC is pretty big too, or any of the big cities. Um, I'm from LA, it's also everywhere. And so the emphasis in exercise is always on how hard can you work, how much can you sweat, how tired and sore are you at the end of it. And sometimes that transfers into kids as well. I see a lot of coaches, I've, I've coached soccer, that's my fun side job, is coaching soccer and I've done that for 15 years. And you see coaches that they run a fitness session and the biggest goal is to just run the kids as much as they can, make them work as hard as they can, when the question should always be, are they moving well? Are they exploring? Are they having fun? Are they being creative? Because that translates so much better. 10 minutes of good movement translates so much better than an hour of just working very hard and sweating a lot. So there's just one, there's a concept known as physical literacy, and I don't know if anybody is familiar with this. This is not my concept, or I didn't create this, but it's something that I think is very applicable to all populations, which is the motivation, confidence, physical confidence, knowledge, and understanding to make physical activity through the life force, meaning physical activity across a wide spectrum, rather than it being goalie oriented or it being performance oriented. And some of the byproducts of that are motivation to capitalize on movement potential, to maintain a positive attitude, and to be happy to practice tryout and to welcome advice and guidance. And I'm gonna connect all these pieces back to Keen in a minute, but I think that the, the last one is one of the biggest things when I go to Keen that I see is that when kids go to the sessions, they're not in a clinical setting where they're being forced to do something. They're actually in a setting where they are open to being happy and to enjoying it and to wanting to return to it and do more of it, which I think is the biggest goal of any learning experience. So that, to me, is just a, a huge thing. Um, one of the, some of the other byproducts of physical literacy and movement in general are, are the fact that it fosters self-esteem, confidence, and social skills. So besides the physical benefits of exercise, which I think at this point for everybody are fairly well known, the fact that it affects these things is such a, a huge thing that I don't think nutrition and other areas of health can touch on in the same way, that you build the self-esteem, you build the confidence, you realize new skills, and also, especially at Keen Sessions, they're able to interact with other kids and with volunteers in a social setting that you can't get in other ways. And I know Bob was mentioning how sports are a big part of, of his life, and sports were a huge part of mine when I was growing up, and I think for these kids, being in an active setting is so much easier to connect with other people, whether it's your own age or in a 
lot of the keen sessions you're connecting with volunteers who maybe are older, but it's still this awesome connection and, and fostering of, of social skills that you can't get in clinical <laughs> settings in the same way. Uh, one of the other <coughs> things about physical literacy, and, and I love this little quote from it because that links up a lot with the way that I think about fitness, is that personal potential must be the key feature in any program design. So it's not basing a program on what you think is the right way for people to exercise, it's looking at each individual kid or each individual person and seeing their potential and then using that to kind of guide what you're doing. So when kids show up at a keen session, they're not coming in with a very structured routine of like, this is what we need to do, we need to, you know, we're not trying to get all the keen athletes coming away with six packs and giant shoulders. We're looking at what what is their potential, which I always think is, is huge, but how do we factor this into what we're going to do with them today? And I think one of the things as a coaches committee member and, and when we pair volunteers with the kids, we always like to tell them about the kid first, just so they have that, that guide to go with, or the volunteers that return for the fifth or tenth or hundredth time, that they can take this and turn it into the right program for that kid, which is so important. All right. One of the other things that, um, that Kate and Joanna had mentioned to me was about how to interact with kids with disabilities. And in general, I work with kids a lot, so all of my friends and anybody I come into contact with naturally assume that I have this magic response of how to talk to kids, which even at keen sessions, I think sometimes people will turn to me or turn to somebody else who's wearing one of the, one of the green keen shirts, which I thought about wearing today. Um, and they'll ask us about ways to talk with the kids, and for me, Speaking to kids with special needs is exactly the same as speaking to kids with out special needs or speaking to adults or speaking to somebody in a business setting. And the biggest factors for me are patience, respect, and genuine interest. So the biggest thing, one of the other big things that I learned working as a behavior therapist was that it required a tremendous amount of patience. So that was, that was number one, a lot of the kids when they would have their behaviors, which were, behaviors were classified as, um, I mean, you could, you could look at it in a lot of ways, but when they were yelling or they were crying or they were acting out in class, the biggest and most effective way to deal with it was waiting for it, was waiting for it to go away. So not responding to it and just waiting for the behavior to slowly go away on its own, which is a very difficult thing to do and requires a tremendous amount of patience. So I think that's that's one of the big things and one of the great things all the people that I see that come in as volunteers to Keen have a tremendous amount of patience. The respect that they are actually a real person, that you are listening to what they're saying, and then whenever they're talking to you, that you actually have a genuine interest in what they're telling you. And I think most people, where they stray talking to kids, in any setting are, is the fact that they don't actually show genuine interest and they don't actually listen and they talk to them in a different way, which the number one way for me to talk to kids is to speak to kids like they're real people. And I think when you do that, it shifts the dynamic between you and kids. You don't have to talk to them like babies. You don't have to talk to them um, any differently than you would somebody in a business while you would be much nicer to kids than somebody in a business meeting, but it would be this interaction with them like they are real people and that their opinions matter and that what they think does matter and recognizing that you're actually hearing what they're saying makes a huge shift in the way that they interact with you and that to me has always been one of the biggest factors that I've realized working with kids and if I'm tired and I'm not listening, my interactions with kids always suffer from that because if I'm not giving them my full attention, they realize that very quickly, and their response is very different. And I think Keen is an awesome situation because you are paired one to one, so you are forced to give that patience and respect, and you are have to be present and engaging with them. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. So one of the other things, going back to physical literacy, just for a second, was. They talk, 
the authors, and there's a few of them, and I can give you resources. I probably should have written it down. Um, they talk about a lot of things, but they do specifically touch on kids with disabilities or people in general. And three of the big things that were my favorites that they always say is that you have to approach it with an open mind, high expectations, and a willingness to adapt. And anytime I go into a cane session, I think that, especially that second one, which I think is something that people overlook sometimes, open mind is usually probably wouldn't be at a keen session if you weren't open-minded. You probably wouldn't go to a keen session if you weren't willing to adapt at least somewhat, but I think the second one of having high expectations is huge because it's not requiring results, but having these expectations that they can do a lot, which every kid that comes to keen, different kids, the expectations for them will be at different levels, but when you interact with them, realizing that your expectations of them should be very high should be that they can accomplish all these things, should be that they can interact with the other kids and they can interact with the volunteers and they can do so much. So not expectations on a result level, but on expectations on what they are able to accomplish. And I think that's one of the greatest things where sometimes I will see a new volunteer and maybe they're a little bit timid working with the kid. They don't want them to get injured or they don't want them to, they, they think they are more limited than they are the second day open it up and they realize that there's all this potential, it is unbelievable. And I, I mean, even yesterday at one of the schools in Virginia, there was a girl that had no legs and she was doing the push-ups, she was doing the jumping, she was doing every single thing that I do with all of the kids at the assembly and she was, I mean, she was doing it better than the majority of the kids there. And it was incredible to see this and realize that the expectation for her should be just as high as everybody else that she can do all of these things. And I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, which goes into the next part. Our responsibility as, I'm not a parent, but as parents, as educators, as volunteers, as people that work with the population. Uh, and I think there's, there's a few things, but for me, the single biggest thing is opportunity, which kind of goes along with inclusion, but is just to give kids, excuse me, I'm losing my voice a little bit from the eight toxic schools. I think opportunity is the single biggest thing, is that just kids have a chance to play, kids have a chance to move. And Across the board, this is a huge issue with kids. There's limited PE classes now. Some of the schools that I used to work at in California don't have PE teachers at all. Some of the schools that I've been to have 800 kids and one PE teacher that's working with 50 kids at a time, and that's just the general classroom. So when you start to look at other challenges facing children with special needs, it becomes even less and less and less available to the point that a lot of these kids like Bob was saying, don't have opportunities at all to get physical activity. So I think the single biggest thing is that we do give them an opportunity to play. That's one of the reasons I absolutely love Keen is because it provides this opportunity. And working with special needs kids and as a behavior therapist, there were so many hurdles all the time with things like, like IEPs, with things like caseworkers, with funding, that every step took so much energy away from actually working with the child just to get the funding, just to get the resources, just to get things available to them, that a lot of times visual, physical education would be 15th or 20th or not even on the list of priorities at all. And giving them an opportunity to actually move and to play and to be included is so important to all these things and all the, the issues and benefits of movement and exercise. The, the other things are giving flexibility, so again, it goes along with the inclusion, but when we're at a program or even within schools, as, as a teacher, especially as somebody, I used to also work as a PE teacher, being able to look at activities and see how we can include kids in them, which is difficult because so many teachers and so many educators do not have training in that area, and in places like the schools in California where kids, they didn't have a PE teacher, a lot of times it would be one classroom teacher would take two classes and go out onto the field. So an untrained teacher in physical education would work with 50 kids at one time, 
twice a week, and that was, you know, to on top of that, find flexibility is a very different, difficult thing. But that's one of our biggest responsibilities, and one of the things I think we should always strive for. And, and the other one is guidance and support, which is just like very straightforward. Just giving the kids the support to do these things, to try new things, to maybe put them in a situation where they might get bumped and bruised, but realizing that they are children and that's what kids do, and letting them play, letting them move, and not treating them like they are special needs kids in that sense, but giving them the opportunities to play. So some of the challenges, um, and again, I, I mentioned a couple of them, but some of the challenges are Similar for all kids, which again having to do with instructors, so having trained instructors. On I see I've been in probably three hundred schools in the past several years and I've met a ton of P teachers and there are teachers that are incredible educators and know their stuff and there are teachers who run their programs having their kids run laps around the gym for 20 minutes and then sit them down and give them long talks that don't mean a lot. And so it is so hard to find people that are in that space that have the patience, that have the flexibility, that understand the programming for children in exercise. And in general, I know in fitness, a lot of my colleagues in gyms tend to get a bad rap for being maybe less educated or maybe being somewhat of meatheads, which is very true a lot of the time. I, I used to work with somebody who was very proud of the fact that he had never read a book before. He, including like high school, he said he, said he got notes from somebody. Um, and it, it, a lot of times that translating them into PE, PE or working with kids and, and doing physical activity with children is a lower paying job requires 10 times more work as anybody working with kids knows. And so by the time it gets to these people that are working with kids, it's usually either they're not trained well enough or they are completely burnt out or exhausted or there just aren't the resources available because it can be very difficult if you actually don't have the physical resources to go with all of these things or if you have 75 kids. The video where the, where the PE teacher stopped to explain to the kid the different in the activities was fantastic, but I know that with my experience, while you're talking to that kid, you can have 20 kids running off, punching each other, or like running off the property, or whatever it is, so it creates these tremendous difficulties and challenges for the people doing it, because they might have the best intentions, they might be everything else, but just the fact that they have so many kids that it's overwhelming creates these new challenges that oftentimes they're not given the resources or a second person to help them. Um, other challenges in, in general are the lack of programs. So there are very few, when I Google searched kids fitness, kids with special needs, there were very few programs that came up, like well, Keen was the only one. Um, and talking to parents over the years, parent kids that I worked with in California, kids and parents everywhere I go, I, I meet people who have kids with special needs and they're just it's very, very little. So there's things like Special Olympics, but in terms of what's available to them consistently, it is incredible how little there is. And that is, again, across the board to kids everywhere outside of organized sports, which can be a great thing. There aren't a ton of opportunities for kids to find good, positive movement. And yeah, I think the, the, the biggest thing is just finding settings and finding opportunities that create a love of movement, that create self-esteem, that create the physical literacy outside of just everybody can put a, a, a child in a baseball program when they're six years old, which is great, but the skills you learn how to hit, how to hit a ball off of a tee don't really translate to a larger sense of movement later in life. And so it's actually these opportunities just aren't available. And the great thing is they are becoming more so. It is, it's definitely a growing field. There are more people doing it. There are more opportunities. But that's one of the, the single biggest challenges. Um, so that kind of brings me, and I, I touched on it, but what Keen does really well, which is 
just the fact, number one, that it does provide this opportunity for kids. That's the single biggest thing is that kids have the opportunity every week to come and play in an environment that's safe, in an environment that their parents can, can go and take a break for an hour and a half. And it's an environment that when we focus on movement and the things that we do in the programs, we're not doing a very structured thing. We're not trying to force them into doing something they don't enjoy. Every single kid gets to do what they want to do and gets to be creative and gets to explore whether it's at the sports program or the basketball program, and this is only from my New York experience, uh, or the swimming program, which has become my favorite. They get to go into these settings and they get to enjoy and they get to develop this self-esteem and they get to set these expectations for themselves even on what they're able to accomplish and week by week when you see kids come maybe the first couple times they're a little hesitant but by the second or third or fourth time they're jumping in the pool immediately or they're running around the gym or they're coming up with the activities on their own without the volunteers help which is <coughs> and the other thing I think he does really well is that it matches these volunteers that kids wouldn't normally have the chance to interact with. So a lot of times these kids, and when I worked as a behavior therapist, I had several kids that I worked with one-on-one, -on -one and I would be at school with them, and then I would go home with them, and sometimes I would be at their house on weekends, and they got sick of my face after <laughs> like 30 hours a week, which is completely understandable, and they got sick of their occupational therapists, and they got sick of their teachers, and they got sick of their doctors, and they got sick of, their caseworkers, and like any kid, they get sick of their parents. And so it's this incredible thing that they can come for an hour and a half and be connected to these people that they would have in, in no other situation be connected with. They're connected with, you know, they're, here's a, a, a 25 year old guy who works in finance that they will never cross on the street, but they're connected with and they have these social interactions that wouldn't happen anywhere else, which I think is unbelievable. And I, I love it too when, when high school kids come in or when younger volunteers come in, but it, it, it's such a wide range of, you know, we have high school kids and we have retired people who are my parents' age. We have, it, it is just such, such a variation that these kids get exposed to that it, it's unbelievable. And I can talk about what I love about Keen all day. It's also just, for me, it's a ton of fun. That's, originally why I started going. Um, and the last thing, I didn't have a picture for this, so. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember, I don't remember why I used this picture in the first place, but it's a, it's a child in a gi crying, climbing a ladder. Um, the, the last thing was just benefits to the volunteers in the community, and I think from for the parents and the families of these kids, I think it's pretty straightforward what it provides, which is that opportunity and everything that comes with it. But for the volunteers, I think it's this incredible thing, and I see people that come in the first time, they're very hesitant. They're very well-intentioned just to sign up for the program, but they're very hesitant dealing with kids with special needs or working with kids at all. And by the end of it, they're having these tremendous interactions. And just for a volunteer to come in and, and have that experience, I think it translates so much over to everyday life that you learn, if you can be patient in a situation where maybe a child is having a behavior and you can take half of that over into your everyday life and the way you interact with other kids or interact with other adults, even in a crazy city like New York where maybe everybody is in play all the time, if you can take just a little bit of that into what you're doing, I think it's just unbelievable and the way that it connects everybody together. Um, I didn't have any other things to consider. I just wanted to leave a few. I just wanted to leave. I just I like that picture too. I have I have way too many stock photos of, of kids doing funny things. Um, so I wanted I wanted to leave just a few minutes if anybody had questions. I know I kind of have a. a broad background that not a lot of people I meet work specifically with special needs kids and exercise. So it's, um, I've been very fortunate that they've crossed over so many times in my life and I, um, I love that. So I think we have a couple minutes if anybody has questions. Nobody has questions. Right? Yeah. So what kind of tools do you give schools or teachers when you're going to these schools for Virginia this week, for example? 
Um, so usually when I go into schools, usually I have gone into schools that are specifically for special needs kids before. Usually it's just public elementary schools. Most of the time I just go in and do an hour long assembly. So the big thing for me is promoting that exercise can be done in any number of ways. And that's the main message that's supposed to come out of my book also is that no matter what kind of exercise or what you like to do, so if you're not a fan of, of team sports, that you can find ways to exercise that you enjoy, whether it be something, an individual thing like tennis or yoga or swimming or riding a bike, or if it comes down to actually creating your own exercises. And that video of the trampoline was just, <laughs> I just love that. Uh, because that's a, when, and when I was working with with, uh, as a behavior therapist, we did a lot of that sort of thing where it was just so, we just improv the whole time and sometimes it did take like reading, I, we didn't use a trampoline but I had that experience and it was just so fantastic that you could find ways to move and to be active if you just put a little bit of creativity and thought into it and that's my biggest thing for kids is that they can actually think of it that way that if they can't do the physical fitness test if they can't do 30 push-ups that there's still a million ways for them to be active and to be successful in that setting. Anybody else was that? I don't have a good, I don't have like a good concluding. Um, you, usually at schools everybody yells and waves their hands around and, and, then, I, and then, I, then they do this and everybody's quiet and they look towards their teachers and the principal so they can, yeah. Um, yeah, so when I talk to parents, that's a good question, do I direct them to other resources? Um, so what I found is that, it, and mostly I am talking to just parents in, in general, I have found trouble finding great resources for fitness for kids. And there are some, but a lot of them, even, even sometimes in programs and, and certifications and workshops that I seen having to do with youth fitness, which are not very common. A lot of them do structure on like the very, like this is the scientific way for you to work out. This will burn calories, and for me, I'm always very hesitant to point them towards that. Um, I sometimes will give them ideas of other ways that, that they can have their kids exercise, and um, I'm starting to see more things. I have, I have a friend in Portland who has a personal training company that only works with kids with special needs. It's fantastic because they actually do get kids in the gym and it's, I went and visited him in May and saw it firsthand and it was just unbelievable. So when I find something like that that I think is amazing, but um, I actually do have trouble sometimes finding things that I really, really believe in all the way because I think usually it has to do more with, at this point, which is one of the issues, usually it has to do more with the individual person than the organization itself, which is an exception to that because every time that I go it's this great experience and the foundation of what it is and, and how everybody comes out of it and how the volunteers are are prepped for working with the kids and the people that, that oversee it and Maggie's not here but she's unbelievable um, she's the New York director it that to me is so much bigger deal so it, yeah I, I would love to see more organizations and groups like me where I could just confidently point people in that direction. For more than two decades, Keene has been providing free sports and fitness programs for kids with disabilities in Washington, D.C. and in locations across the country. For more information on the symposium or on Keene, please visit their website at www.keenusa.org.